One of the most fundamental questions of us all, of all of humanity, is, is there any meaning to failure, to death, to the weakness of old age? We're now going to look at one of the most dramatic deaths in the history of humanity. The one who came to bring love, to reveal to each person that they were precious. The one who in so many ways was vulnerable and good and kind is rejected. He's put aside. The one who was admired for his miracles has become an object of ridicule. Here we're in front of one of the most telling moments of oppression and of hate and of violence. But we know that violence and oppression continues in this world of ours. And it's the story of humanity, of people that are abused and crushed and oppressed. It's children who are abused as if people can't stand their weakness and their call for tenderness. Women are abused. It's a whole history of, of humanity where power pushes down the weak. One can maybe ask many questions about power. Why, oh why, is power used to push people down instead of to bring them up? What is the fear behind all this? What is the fear in me when I use power not to liberate but to keep people down? Because in all of us, I believe, there's a lot of violence. And I think there's a lot of fear in all of us. We have a capacity, all of us, to hurt people, to crush people and I dare say even to kill people. Maybe that's one of the greatest fears that we all have, is to kill another person when we are provoked to a form of anger which becomes hate and then becomes violence. And so we see Jesus. He's been condemned by Pilate. He's been condemned by the religious authorities who want to hold on to their meager power. And Jesus goes forth. And what is extremely beautiful in this Gospel of John is Jesus is serene. He carries on his own the log of the cross. And there he's accomplishing the mission of the Father. The mission of the Father, his mission, is to witness to truth. Lies, publicity, hatred, violence can be loud. Evil can scream, evil can roar. But there's something very silent about truth. There's a quietness. It's like a little light, maybe like a little candle in the darkness. Truth never imposes itself. It is there. And for any of us who want to receive it, it's just open, a compelling invitation, a light that is calling us. But that means that somewhere my sacred space, what is deepest in me, is open to the quiet murmurings of truth. Jesus goes out carrying the log, walking to Golgotha. He goes out as a free man, a man who is free. He had already said these words and I just like to, to cite them because it talks about his freedom and his desire to, to give life. We find it in the 10th chapter of John. I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will heed my voice. 
so there shall be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. Jesus walks up to Golgotha, which means the skull. And Jesus is crucified between two men. He is in the middle, revealing that he's in the middle of humanity and in the middle of the whole mystery and evolution of humanity. Pilate has put an inscription over the cross of Jesus. And that inscription was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Jesus, King of the Jews, a proclamation. The religious authorities go to Pilate and they say, we don't like that inscription. What we would want is that he says, he said that he was the king of the Jews. Pilate, no, he doesn't, he doesn't want to change it. And he just says, what I have written, I have written. And in some way, his words become script, scripture, rather like a prophetic writing. This here dying before on, this, on so many people, dying on that little hill, hill called Gothada. Here we have the king of love. And we are all called in some way to stand in awe in front of this man who is a source of truth and a source of love. You see, truth is for us all. Truth doesn't belong to one group, to an elite group. Truth is God. And we're all called to, in some way, welcome this truth, bow down before truth, and be in awe in front of this truth. The four soldiers who crucified Jesus stripped him of his clothes. He stripped of everything. He stripped of his friends. He stripped of mobility. He stripped of everything. And yet, this naked king is revealing a naked truth, a stark truth. So here we have the naked king and one cannot but almost hear the words of Isaiah contemplating many centuries back this wounded Christ. Who can believe what we have heard? He had no form, no comeliness that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Surely he's borne our sufferings and carried our griefs. Yet we, we esteemed him stricken, punished by God, afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our sinfulness. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. Who can believe that this naked man in pain is the king of our hearts? Who can believe that this man dying is the one who came to bring us to freedom and to take us out of chaos. 
this man who came to break the chain of violence to liberate us all, to break the chain of violence through forgiveness. We know the beloved disciple is holy. He is loved by Jesus. He is the beloved one. We know that Mary is holy because she was the first one to welcome the Word made flesh in humanity and in our universe. She welcomed the Word made flesh in her flesh. It was her flesh that permitted the Word to become flesh. And so they are brought together. The work of Jesus is to bring people together. That is the whole of the mystery which was his prayer. Father, that they may be one as you and I are one. That we may be in them so that they may be together one. And it is this holiness that brings them together in one. And there the mystery is that Jesus doesn't say to John, look after my mother. He says, here is your mother. And in a mysterious way, as Mary brought Jesus to birth, Jesus is asking her to bring to birth Jesus in the beloved disciple, so that he may grow and become like Jesus, dare I say, become Jesus. After Jesus has brought Mary and John to together, Jesus cries out, all is accomplished. And to fulfill scripture, he cries out, I thirst. In biblical language, I thirst means I am in anguish. And then Jesus crying out, I thirst, because He's been telling his mother in a mysterious way, don't look at me, look at John. And so these last moments, Jesus is alone. The one who came to create community dies in loneliness. And we have then his cry, I thirst, I am in anguish. Some of those who heard that cry dipped a sponge in some vinegar and put the vinegar on his lips. And then it is said that crying out, all is accomplished. He inclined his head and he gave out the spirit. Those last words, the giving out of the spirit, the text does not say he inclined his head and then gave out his last breath. The Greek word is paradokin. He gave out the spirit. He inclines his head and gives out the spirit. We don't know the exact time that Jesus died, but it was approaching the beginning of the feast of the Passover. So the religious authorities came to Pilate and asked Pilate that they might take the bodies, the three bodies, off the cross, because it was not possible to have the feast of the Passover with these three bodies almost domineering Jerusalem, because it was just above. And so Pilate gave permission that their legs should be broken. Maybe you might think, as I might think, to break somebody's legs, that doesn't kill anyone. But it does. You see, if somebody is hanging from a cross, and his legs are nailed to the cross. The only way that person can breathe is by pushing up gently 
on the feet, excruciating pain, and is only then able to take in a little oxygen. So we can be sure that when Jesus spoke, it was hardly audible to conserve the oxygen. Because when the legs are broken, then they can no longer breathe. And it was a form of torture that the crucified people would be asphyxi asphyxiated. But then it is said that the soldiers, when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead. So they did not break the legs. But one of the soldiers took his spear and pierced the heart of Christ, pierced the side of Christ, and flowed blood and water. And so we discovered that this dramatic event, this terrible event, this event where it appears that love has been conquered by death, where hate has been, where love has been conquered by hate, this terrible moment when the innocent one has been crushed by power, we suddenly see a ray of hope coming from the heart of Christ. Water begins to flow. And these are the waters that will symbolize and symbolize the gift of the Spirit, who is going to break the chain of violence into forgiveness, change the hearts of stone into flesh. It's the symbolizing of the giving of the Holy Spirit to all people. John the Baptist had announced Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This little lamb who was the victim has now become the Savior, and he gives life to the world. But also he gives life to each one of us and to each person who today is being crucified. Because today throughout the world, there are men and women who are crucified, who are pushed down, and in a mysterious way, their pain linked to the pain of Christ can become a source of life. Some of those who are in the greatest pain of our world today, and there are hundreds of thousands of them, are those who have AIDS, who are HIV positive. And I'm thinking of children. I'm thinking of children in Africa who are looking after their dying parents. And recently, some children, young, 12, said that their greatest suffering, their greatest pain, was not to find food, but it was to find rags to clean up their incontinent parents. That is an example. But we all know there are many other examples. I have one little example of a young woman that I know who is psychotic. She goes in and out of hospital. Just recently, I had a chance and we talked together in a cafe in Paris. She wasn't well. She could hardly speak. And she said, I, I don't want to go to the psychiatric hospital. And the only thing that gave her courage was when I said, but she knows it already that you are important to Jesus. Your prayer is important. Your prayer is important because you can give life. You can give your pain and put it in the heart of the pain of Christ on the cross. There is a mystery in suffering. Suffering is not just something negative. We must do all we can to alleviate pain. But when we've done everything, like this woman, everything has been done to help her not to be psychotic. But you know, as I know, there are cycles of pain for some people. That when all is said and done, that girl has hope 
because she knows that in some mysterious way, through her faith, she can give peace to the world. There are other people who do not have their faith. They are crucified in slum areas. They are old people all alone in hospitals or institutions. They might be people in prison. Maybe they have no faith, but in some way they are calling men and women to stand by them as Mary at the foot of the cross, to love them and to say in a way, your pain has meaning. We must do all we can to alleviate their pain. We must struggle against all the injustices in the world. But finally, we are called to stand close to those who are dying and in pain in order to give them hope.